general election. Tonight's forum features candidates running for Jackson's mayor and Jackson's town council. I'm Susan Dong, your moderator, and a member of the League of Women Voters. Tonight's forum is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Wyoming, Teton County Library, Jackson Home News and Guide, Jackson Home Community, Community Radio, KHOL 89.1, and Buck Rail, with funding provided by the Teton County Library Foundation and Friends and the Community Foundation of Jackson Hole. Sam Pope is video recording this session, so thanks to all these people and organizations for their support and commitment to informing you, the voters. A little more info about our forum process. The alarm time for tonight's mayoral candidates is 30 minutes. After a short reshuffling, the four town council candidates will be seated at approximately 6.40 p.m. Time for that session will be 50 to 60 minutes. We'll have time at the end for informal conversations with audience members. The evening will officially end at 8 o'clock. For all sessions, the candidates will have one minute to introduce themselves, one and one half minutes to respond to each question asked by our media panelists, and for the mayoral candidates, our student media panelists are Dante from KHL Radio and Marianne from Buck Rail. The order of questions will rotate. Media panelists will have their own prepared questions. We'll also use questions submitted by you, the audience. Thus, you, the audience, are encouraged to submit questions on a postcard, a note card. Note cards will be collected and delivered by Sandy Shutrine. She's standing over there. Um, she's a member of the League of Women Voters. She'll give the note cards to the media panel for possible use. Then there's a one minute wrap up by each candidate. Additionally, each, each candidate has a red card, which may be used twice for one minute each. The red cards offer candidates more time to elaborate on a point, contest another candidate's answer, or to speak to an issue that hasn't otherwise come up. Candidates signal your intent to use the red card by showing the card to me. Karen Jerger, a League of Women voter member, is our timekeeper. A yellow sign indicates that candidates have 30 seconds left. A red sign means stop. However, candidates are allowed to finish a sentence or a short thought, but not continue beyond that. A reminder to the candidates, please speak directly into the microphone so the audience and video equipment can hear you. Now, we're going to start with introductions for our Jackson mayoral candidates, Jessica Sells Chambers and R. Jorgensen, who are very scientific Matter. Arn will go first with his intro, his one minute intro. Please. Thank you so much. Um, volume work? Okay. Um, I'm Arn Jorgensen. I'm currently on the town council. I'm running for mayor. My cell phone number is 690 2269. My website is arnjorgensen.com. Um, please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much for the sponsors, for our journalists and the many, many hours that I know go into these events, and I very much appreciate it. Uh, yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, my parents instilled in me a deep, deep appreciation of this place, of the conservation of this place. Many of you in this room know them. Many of you understand where that's coming from. Over my um, childhood and adult life, I've been able to live, fortunately, in Ecuador, Maryland, Maine, New Hampshire, each of those places and then coming back home in 89, each of those places helped me understand a wide variety of communities and appreciate the nuances of what community means. Those are the two reasons I'm doing this job. And I feel very strongly about this community, deeply, deeply in love with it, and very much ask um, for your vote and look forward to hearing from you with any comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you, Arne. Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Sell Chambers, running for mayor. I'm a current councilwoman. I serve next to Arn. This is how we sit in meetings, so I'm very comfortable here. Last night we had to switch places while we were at a forum. Um, this afternoon, I was at the grocery store and I ran into Mark Huffman and um, he asked me how things were going, obviously. I'm like, how are you? And he was working on the obituary for Abby Garman who was a mayor, he just passed away at the uh, age of 94, clearly he did not take care of himself. Um, but he was giving me all of this information about Abby, and um, he was 
He came here from Iran uh, to the U.S. He went to college and then he ended up here in Jackson. And um, he started his own businesses from scratch. One of them was the Ranch Inn. And so I thought that was a little bit sad that he just, before he died, watched the Ranch Inn get taken down. Apparently, one of his campaign slogans, though, was, aren't you tired of this? And he would take out pages, as in the paper, with that. Aren't you tired of this? And I thought that was really great, because I think it's very fitting for today. Aren't you tired of this? I am. That's why I'm running for mayor. Thank you. Now we're going to start with our media questions. Our first media question is from Dante to Jessica. Thanks, Susan. Jessica, what role do you usually play in a team? You know, thank you, Dante. Someone else asked this, and I had a really great answer. I'm going to see if I can remember it. I think I would be, you know, the movie Moneyball, the, the story about the baseball team, that the Oakland A's, and they started, they used to just do the baseball planning and um, picking teams the same way that everyone always did, and then they invited this I can't remember his name, and I should have. What's his name? Bean. Bean? Yeah. Bean. 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 Jelly Bean. 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 Okay. Well, that's the, that's the player. That's the teammate I would be, is I'm the teammate that says, hey, we can do things differently. We've been doing a lot of the same things for a really long time. It's not working. And we can do things in a different way, in a bold way. And we're kind of in a crisis. I mean, not kind of. We're in a crisis with housing, child care, cost of food. Everything, and so I think that requires bold leadership that's decisive, that's able to take action. And as a mayor, I think that's even more important because you have to be able to see the problems, be, like see people in distress, observe. Oh, I have so much time. Um, but just recognize when people are in distress, and then say there is a problem here. Bring it back to the council so that they can discuss but ultimately put it on the agenda and take action, but not be afraid to make a decision and see how it plays out. And so I'm, I would be the beam of the team and I would make courageous and different decisions. Um, I appreciate the question. I think my initial response to that, it depends on the team. Mm -hmm. Depends on the makeup of the team. Depends on the strengths that are represented by whatever those team members are. And as the leader of a team, which is the mayor in this particular situation, it's a matter of working with all the voices in the room. It's a matter of working with um, the community as issues come up. And recognizing that we each come to these discussions from different places. We each come to these discussions with different strengths and being willing to accommodate that. Um, it is also, and I feel this very deeply, it's also showing up for the work. I'm not a performative politician. I'm not out there looking for the headline. I want to get the work done. And when I hear a question, when I hear a concern, um, I will sit down with staff. I will sit down with the public comment if we've got any ahead of time um, to work through what that question is, to have a discussion so I'm understanding it, um, then can act on moving that process forward given the capacity that we have to do so. Um, town council, current role that we both play, and mayor, we do have limitations. We do have limitations on how, what we can act on. I think one of the things that I try really hard to recognize is that recognize that people come to these discussions from different places and making sure that in the realm that we control, we're supporting the full community. Terrific. How much time do we have? Because it just seems like a minute, 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 minute. a minute and a half. A minute okay. and a half. This is amazing. Too little or too much? No, it's perfect. perfect. <laughs> I'm just waiting Whoa. for that <laughs> stop sign. <laughs> Miriam, your question, please. Thank you. How would you define the responsibilities of the mayor of Jackson? You know, again, I, I and I've used this term a couple times lately. Um, you know, the, the, the initial reaction that you hear about that a lot, and it's true, is we're representing the voters. That's what we do. The voter, we're, we're making our case to the voters. We're asking for your vote, um, doing that in a respectful way and listening. When we're sitting there, it's our job to lead. It's our job to move something forward. And one of the things that, 
I think it's important for us to recognize we have to respond in a way that people are feeling heard with respect. Um, but at the end of the day, it's up to that team to make that decision and move that forward, given, again, the constraints that we might feel in this community or that we have in this community. Um, we are incredibly fortunate in this community. We live in, warm, we live in an amazing place. Um, it's a place that does have stress attributed to it. Um, decisions that were made over the last many, many, many decades have created a place that um, we, we are stewards of, we are responsible for. So I look at local government, mayor, town council, county commissioners, as being those stewards and working through with our community members, with our staff, treating people with respect. Um, that's what I look at the, at the role. There is also a, in the mayor, there is being the face of the community element to it as well. People look to the mayor to communicate community concerns, communicate things that we are proud of, and there are many in this community. Um, it's all of those things I've heard recently that, and I don't remember where, I'll stop now. Okay, the question was, what is the role of the mayor? Okay. Responsibilities. And responsibilities. Well, let's just have a little civics lesson. Um, so, the, I don't know if everybody knows this, but the town of Jackson is not in fact a town. Do you know that? We are very technically a first class city. We got special permission from the state to call ourselves a town. I think Mr. Anderson was on the council at that point. I think that's a great idea. Um, I don't think that it fits us anymore. And I think that we have kind of gotten stuck in the town mentality that we're, we're smaller than we are, that we don't have as complex of problems as we have. And I'm actually gonna go back to Abby Garriman because when he became mayor, he had this idea about professionalizing the organization, professionalizing the town government. And so that was the first time that they hired a town manager because before that, the mayor did that. I think a lot was changing at that point and that was appropriate to hire a town manager because the, man, the mayor could no longer handle everything. And I think we've come into another point in our history where we have to recognize that the mayor is limited. The mayor cannot get into the weeds. The mayor has to recognize the problems, like I said, and put them on the agenda and then know when to ask someone else for help. And so as mayor, the true, true, true uh, role is to set the agenda and chair the meeting. And so I think it's essential for a mayor to have a vision, ask the council to make choices and decisions, and then give that off to people with more expertise and let them bring information back to you. <clears throat> Thank you. Dante will ask the next question, and Jessica will answer first. Yeah, Jessica, community character is an often used phrase by electeds and residents alike. What does it mean to you, and what would you do to preserve it if you think it should be preserved? Community character? Preserve that? Um, of course we don't want to preserve community character. Community character to me is more than just the physical structures around us. Really the essence of community uh, is the people. Those are, it's the people in the community, the workers, blue collar, um, nurses, firefighters, plumbers, electricians, the people that are boots on the ground they cannot do their jobs remotely. I think they give us the character in the community and we've pushed a lot of them out and there's not a lot of space for them. And they're the backbone of our community. And so I think making sure that we retain our working class people um, uh, and also emergency service providers, that gives us color by making sure that we have a place where our kids can come home after they go to college. That preserves character. That gives us color. And, and right now, I think as many of us know, that's not, that is not what's happening. So our community character is being actively dismantled by us not taking actions, um, making decisions that move us forward and not just sit on our hands. Because I think there's been a lot of sitting on hands with the council over the last, I don't know, six, seven years. And I'm ready to take action and move forward so that we can address the rules and the regulations that are breaking the community down, like our land development regulations and our zoning that are pushing people out by increasing property values and property taxes. The community's getting squeezed, and if we lose the community, the actual people, it won't matter what this place looks like physically. 
it will be empty. I gave those seconds back. Did you see that, Karen? <laughs> I didn't take it all. This is not, there's no judgment. <laughs> sure. It's a give and take. I'll give it back. Surely a time. I, community character is a fascinating term, and I appreciate it. It's, it is a combination, as I said earlier in my introduction, um, both about this place, the physical environment in which we're fortunate to live in Stewart, as well as the community of people. It very much is a combination of that. Um, I remember distinctly sitting at Marty, Marty Murray's porch talking about community, talking about the fact, and this, as many people know, one of our eminent national leaders environmental issues, but recognize the community is part of that. And it's something that is deep, deep in my heart. Um, I had an interesting discussion, you know, this is a month and a half ago, and somebody was talking about a loss of cultural memory, which I thought was a really interesting way to think about community character a little bit differently. The reality is it's changed. It's changed since my father showed up here in the mid-50s. My mother's, yes, there's a backstory there, some of you know that. Um, when they came in the late 50s, early 60s, and when we came back from Maryland in the mid-70s, when I was able to move back in 89, we each were part of a change in community character. There was stress at each one of those points. And I think it's important to recognize it's not static. But this notion of cultural memory, to me, is an interesting way to think about it. The rate of change is different today. The ability to assimilate both people that are coming in in a new sense, to be able to assimilate with existing character and existing um, cultural memory, um, that rate of change is now making it more difficult to integrate as a community. And I see that very, very clearly. Um, we have done a lot to preserve our human community. Um, we have over 1,600 residential, restricted residential units for community members. I feel very in touch with pride, and a very in touch with pride from that, and why I continue that. Thank you. Marianne will then ask the big question, and Arne will answer first. Thank you. Arne, what is your vision for Jackson 10 years from now? Thinking about Jackson 2034, what's one thing you could accomplish during your term to realize this vision? Um, thank you. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting question, as I just mentioned. We have been through change in the past. We will go through change in the future. Um, to me, having a community where we have a mix of community members, we have a wide range of community members that are able to live here. I mentioned the 1,600 units that are in place now of, of housing units. We need to double that. We need to make sure that we have a wide cross-section of units available so people can live and work and vote in this community. Um, I feel really strongly that without a local presence that our um, voice for conservation will be diminished. So when I think about 10 years from now, that we're not just a resort only, because we're not that now. That we have a wide range of locals that are willing to step up and advocate for this place, both the human community as well as the national environment. And the way that happens is we have places to live and thrive, to thrive as a community while honoring this place. And that's something that is deeply embedded in my soul, by my parents, by my namesakes. Um, this is something that I take very seriously. Um, we will look different in 10 years. So the decision to me, the discussion to me is, how do we use the tool to build a local government to ensure that that change is bringing with it a public benefit? So in the, in the realm of housing, if we have a choice between high-end condominiums versus housing that's built and occupied people, people that live and, rent, that live and work in this community, um, that we're looking to, for ways to tweak it to the latter. And be able to make that choice. It could also be small businesses um, in addition to that. Will you repeat that question again, please? Sure. What is your vision for Jackson 10 years from now, thinking about Jackson in 2034? What's one thing you would accomplish during your term to realize this vision? Thank you so much for that question. 10 years from now, my son will be 20 years old. I would like Jackson to be a place that he can come home, and if he doesn't want to live with his parents for much longer than a few years, that he would be able, that he would be able to have a place to live, um, as well as all of his friends that are going to be the same age. I don't know if, I, I think some of you know that when I was 27, my mom died, and I ended up leaving my life in New York where I was going to school, and I moved back to Pittsburgh to take care of my little brothers. They were 9 and 15. And um, I ended up getting custody of, from, of them from my father, who struggled with mental health issues and, and alcoholism. And um, we ended up moving them out here 
uh, with my husband Reed, who's here recording. Thank you. And um, we raised him here. He started in fifth grade and went all the way through the high school, was even a Rotary Exchange student. Um, but there's no place for him now. And he lets me know this all the time, that he and his friends, there's no place. They can't afford it, there's no work for them. And that's sad, but I see a moment now that we can make changes so that doesn't have to be the case in 10 years. I hope that in 10 years the community looks different in that all of our kids are able to come back here after high school. I think that we can take action right now, tomorrow, not wait until January until a new council is seated, and change zoning, change land development regulations, assist people with childcare so that they have options um, that are affordable and accessible and safe, in addition to many things. Thank you, Darren. Oh, it's me again. This thing last yeah, time. Yeah. 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 This is working better. <laughs> Should we dance? Nothing. <laughs> you know you're going to win. So. <laughs> okay. Right. Jessica. Yes. Attendance has been an issue for the town council, which formalized its policy about excused or unexcused absences during both your times on the council. What is your stance on that policy, and what has your attendance record been? Thank you so much for that question, Dante. So this is this is this is a fantastic question. For a long time, we didn't really have any uh, policies in place to say how many absences were appropriate or inappropriate, or if you missed X number of meetings. I think three out of every four, or it was four meeting, four consecutive meetings, that you would lose your seat on the council. But technically, we didn't have a rule for that. That's what the state statute said, but we didn't put anything in place. So when we had some absences, we, I said we should definitely have a policy, because policies are good, you know? Clear rules, boundaries, fences. Um, so we did that, and so we have codified that with our ordinances. Um, this last year, I guess it was 2023, I had some absences. But um, the reason I had some absences was because I was involved in a federal criminal trial against an OBGYN in New York City that sexually assaulted his patients. And so I was asked to testify. Um, so I was traveling to New York for a trial prep and went to the hearing and then followed, sorry, <laughs> a little shaky, um, followed along um, through the through the process, and so I was going back to New York, and um, the guy was finally sentenced and put in jail on my birthday last summer, uh, for and he'll be there for life. Um, so I missed some meetings like that, and for that, but then I was also recognizing that my body was wearing down, my mental health was suffering, and so my husband and my colleagues supported me to go take some time, a sabbatical of sorts. But I, I didn't know how helpful that could be. And that kind of reset me and I came back and I've been stronger than ever and really focused. And so I'm glad we have the policy, I'm glad we have the support from everybody for me to do that and be here now. Thank you, Arne. Um, it, it's a good question, it's a difficult question. And I'm aware of the history, Jessica and I talked about that. Um, we all need grace, we all need the space to take care of ourselves. Um, we each have, each are doing this job in a different light, in a different time in our lives. I'm very proud of the fact I'm able to show up. I'm very proud of the fact that I can come to meetings. They may be topics I'm not particularly excited to talk about, but it's part of the job, whether it's the budget, um, whether it's the wide range of other things that we look at. Um, for me, and Jessica just shared with you a story that is, that is deep and very personal, um, I'm not going to judge that. It's not up to me that Jessica will make that decision. I knew me and her had many discussions about that, and I'm not going to question that. And I will give her that grace, just as I do the rest of my colleagues. Um, so to me, the state statute, the, the four meetings that was in state statute, we now have in place a more clear policy. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a matter of showing up. It's a matter of being there when these decisions need to be made. And then having the I don't know whether it's the confidence, I'm not sure what the right word is here. Um, at some point, you know, asking ourselves, is this the right job for me? Um, and that's something we all need to do. And I will never judge somebody for whatever time they need to have that discussion for themselves. Terrific. Well, we have time for one more question and as well as wrap up. 
So Miriam will ask the sixth question, and Arne will answer first. Thank you. You both initially voted against the Justice Center initiative. How would you explain that vote? Where do you stand on the current SPET request today? Great question, thank you. Um, the Justice Center is a county project. I'm not questioning their process. It's on the SPET ballot. I will gladly vote for it. I feel that very, very strongly. Teton County and the town of Jackson, we're unique in how we deal with SPET. Every other county in the state, there's a negotiation that takes place. And that negotiation is not one where it's judging something in Laramie is more important than Medicine Bow or in Albany County, and it happened to be a random county. Um, every county in this state has that back and forth. We haven't had to because we only have one municipality. So we're not used to that kind of discussion and that kind of negotiation that we had. I felt at the meeting where the two of us voted against it was the meeting at that point where we left the discussion that the needs of the town of Jackson were not being heard. Um, I knew there'd be another vote, and I knew there'd be an opportunity for me to sit down and have discussions with my with my county commissioner colleagues. Um, and I'm very happy that it passed, and I'm very pleased that it's on the ballot, and I strongly am supportive of it on the ballot. Um, if I wanted to question their process on how important that is to the county and this community, I would run for county commissioner. I trust their process. I trust their process to do what they need to do. Um, and I feel very comfortable with that, how that played out, and the ongoing discussion that we will be having about both the town priorities and core services, as well as the county priorities and core services. Okay, so that courthouse. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay, so the county, um, we have been saying we've got funding issues for a while. That's been a top priority, especially of the vice mayor. Um, and so we've mentioned to the county that we are paying too much for our joint departments, fire EMS, start pathways, etc. And we've tried to engage them in conversations about adjusting those percentages so our town residents are not paying more than their fair share because we all pay property taxes. And they go to the county. Um, actually, on that note, we also pay half a mil of property taxes in town, which I voted against because I do not want to tax anyone anymore than we're already being taxed. Um, what I thought was unfair was that the county sort of baited the town to come to a discussion about the set for the courthouse, saying, if you guys let us put this on the ballot, we will talk to you about giving you that, that, that money. We'll have that conversation. Only if the set passes. Well, for me, it's unacceptable for us to negotiate over safety, and the courthouse could fall down at any point if we have an earthquake. It's been long overdue. The county did not take care of this when they needed to. And so at that point, we had no choice but to ask the voters for the SPET, for, for the voters to bail us out. Um, but for me, safety is paramount. I'm not going to tie an issue of safety to our funding issues that we can figure out on our own. Thank you. I realize that we're getting to the end of this process. <laughs> I'm saying why, just so you know. Well, I, I'm breaking it up so you don't have to hear me join on for, not that we're all joining, but join on for three minutes at the end. Um, so, so, and I want to go back to a question that was asked earlier that I realized I didn't ask, I didn't answer, which was what's one thing I'd like to achieve that it would impact that vision in 10 years from now? And Jessica just talked about budget kind of realities. The budget realities of the town of Jackson we're based on concepts that are several decades old that are not holding up to the pressures of time in terms of our revenues versus expenses. Um, the town of Jackson runs a very tight ship. One of the things that most people are not aware of because you don't see it, it's not public because our town manager manages our community, our, our organization well, is there's a lot of vetting that goes on before it comes to, before it comes to the council. And so putting in place partnerships with the county as a community, how do we look at funding all of our community needs and trying to get out of these silos of town, joint department, and county, and recognizing we are truly one community. And it's something that I feel very strongly about. We'll continue to push that in order 
to get to that vision, it's going to be important that we are functioning as local entities. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Why is this so hard? I don't know. Who, where are we? Right, another well, question. we're ready to have closing comments, but I didn't know. Are you going to use your red card or not? I wanted to use them with my closing statement. That's fine. We'll do that then. Okay. So it's now we've had six questions and an intro, and now we have closing comments. And Jessica will use her red card with her one minute closing co comments. So she two minutes. No, I have, well, I have three. I have three. Oh, you're going to do both of them. them. <laughs> okay, that's not fine. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Um, well, well, let me just say, just to be clear, I voted for the SPEP for the courthouse. I just did not sign the MOU. I did not vote for the MOU that tied that vote to our funding, just to be clear. Um, okay, this is a little bit difficult for me, but I just want to share something with you all and, and, and share it, like let you help me bear this burden. This is an email that I wrote in 2018 to all of the people that won their races um, Art and I ran against each other. He beat me that year. Hopefully not this year. Um, but okay, I, and just bear with me, this is hard. Hi guys, I'm still processing the election results, but I felt compared to share this with you. I was speaking with a man just 30 minutes ago at the GH Center for Global Affairs Conference on Climate and Energy, Coal, etc. in the world in Wyoming. We were talking in the Center for the Arts lobby about politics and understanding the experience of a woman as a man and how that's difficult to do as a man. At least that's what I was saying. Please, I had to hear this, and I'm gonna share it. He interjected that, no, I don't have a vagina, but I am a vaginatarian. This was at a professional conference. I was obviously stunned by the comment and couldn't speak for about 20 seconds, maybe more. I had been mid-sentence when he interjected that. He said, come on, that was a joke. I was shaken, still um, pit in my stomach, and uh, I had some responses from Mark Newcomb. He sent me this fantastic response, and um, I'll read it to you. Jessica, thanks for sharing. As ridiculous as it is that you even had to, had to and ended up in that situation, Absolutely a horrible comment. And worse to think of what's behind it. Nothing will change overnight. Men need to think every day how our actions and words can degrade, stereotype, hurt, and reinforce bias. You lay out some ways that we can help. Fundamentally, we have to change. Man to man, father to son, boy to boy. Mark responded. Luther responded. Jonathan responded. Arn never responded. I came across a cartoon a few days ago that was a really horrible, um, sexist joke about sexual harassment and I will spare you the details it was drawn by a council candidate that you'll hear from next and I've been told that I'm like making a big deal about it um, that I should dial it back my outrage but I've heard from women across the community that's unacceptable um, it was made as a joke this cartoon was made as a joke and I'm so tired of hearing that it's, it, he's a nice guy. It's just a joke. It's unacceptable, and this is another reason I'm running for office, because if we don't have women in the room for these decisions and these conversations, we're missing a whole huge lived experience. And that's, like I said, one of the reasons I'm running for mayor. Sadly, when I showed this cartoon to Arn the other night at the council meeting, you shrugged your shoulders. I'm Jessica Sell Chambers. I ask for your vote so we can bring everybody together and move everybody forward, taking care of every single person in the community. I just want to make something, and I will be using my remaining render. Um, <laughs> Anybody. Um, that's not the time and place that I feel like that that was a time to have that discussion. Um, 
you know as well as probably anyone at this point is email is not my preferred way of communication. I'm not a great writer, I acknowledge that. Um, you and I have had multiple times to talk about things and I have worked very hard to be respectful in those discussions. Um, I am proud of the way that I have conducted myself. I'm proud of my family that's made up of many, many strong women and particularly my two mothers, second time I'm bringing up both of them, and how they have instilled in me a sense of caring and humility that when I'm dealing with something that I even have a little experience, that I have confidence to reach out to people that I trust, people that I can lean on to work through those kind of challenges. I don't share that. Um, I have, I am incredibly proud of the work that I've done to grant other people the opportunity, women included, people that have various levels of disadvantage to step in to positions of power, and I'm proud of that. Um, I am Martin Jorgensen, I'm running for mayor. I love this community dearly. This is something I feel very, very passionate about. I will work incredibly hard to treat everybody with respect, regardless of where they're coming from, on the wide range of issues that face this amazing community that we all are fortunate enough to be calling home. And this is something that is deep, deep embedded in my soul. Um, I will work hard for each of you. I will listen to each of you. And that's something that, that I commit to you at this point. Thank you very much. I ask for your vote. Thank you. for your continued commitment to our community. You've both been excellent council members and we're looking forward to your leadership as mayor.